So I'm here at the Dutch Hunters Rendezvous. <laughs> this Daniel. This is uh, November 2022. I'm with Wayne Tunnel. It's November 6th, <laughs> about 1 o'clock in the morning. Plenty of fireball. Captain Morgan went down the drain. <laughs> I'm Wayne Tuttle, and this is... Cha oh, that's right. We're not in that one. Oh, today, we're, you're going to be talking to the svelte and handsome, good-looking Michael McChesney. <laughs> With that, Mike, man, I wanna, I, you're a wealth of knowledge. you got a lot of great information. And one of the things I want to know about is Victoria Peak, but I also want to know about Doc Noss and Tony Jolly. Doc Noss getting shot. And him hiding his gold before and Tony Jolly helping him. Yep. All right, well, Doc had managed to take out about 300 bars from Victoria Peak. Now, the bars they had at Victoria Peak were dory bars. They were real rough cast, black and nasty, because we have Ovanos, who describes exactly what happened when Doc first came, when he first went down to Victoria Peak and came out, he was describing the stuff he found to her. You know, there were chests with correspondence in it. There was one big wooden box with the word Carlotta on it. And inside that box was the tiara with, with ruby, with a big pigeon blood ruby and a bunch of diamonds and stuff. Um, that was on the first level. Then the next level down, there was where they had all the body, the skeletons that were staked down to the floor that had died there. And then the very lower level where all the gold bars were. But they didn't look like gold bars. Because what Doc told Ova when he came back out was the Spanish must have really loved pig iron because there's ricks of it down in the down in this lower chamber. And she goes, bring one of those bars up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Ova said, Well, bring one of those bars up. He said, they're heavy as hell. She says, Well, bring one of them up. So he went down in the cage, he climbed all the way back down to the lower caverns. One of the bars, but you gotta remember these things were 40 or 50 pounds a piece. So he dragged this thing up because there was a bunch of pinch spots where he had to squeeze through to get up. Finally got up and he gets a bar and he says, there's your damn bar. And he threw it on the ground. He said it hit the, hit the ground and it scooched and flipped over and you could see the streaks of gold from where it had hit the ground. And so they had a new outlook on those ricks of bars that were in the lower levels. And so he managed to get 300 of them out approximately with the help of a guy named Benny Samaniego. And when he was done, he gave Benny three of the bars for helping him, which is, and he also gave him uh, one of the suits of armor that was in there. Benny used to wear it riding in parades and stuff. There's a bunch of pictures of Benny Samaniego wearing this stuff. Um, and those three bars are also how Benny Samaniego managed to buy five adjacent lots in town, and he built a house on one of them. His family still owns all the property to this day. Um, and he was planning originally to sell the 300 bars to an acquaintance of his name, Charlie Ryan. And Charlie Ryan was a lead miner. He owned, he owned a couple mines. And he had made, he struck up a deal with Doc to sell him the 300 bars. And Doc had already told him the approximate location of it, didn't tell him exactly where they were. Now, the story was that Doc had gone over to check on something at Charlie Ryan's house, and he passed by the window, and he overheard him talking about robbing him the next day. They said, we're going to take the gold bars, but we're not going to give him the money. So now he's desperate because he realized that he already told the guy that's about to rob him most, mostly where the bars are. So he had one night to do something about it. So he's looking around and he finds, he goes to a gas station and he sees a rodeo buddy of his named Tony Jolly. And he says, Hey, Tony, would you give me some help? He says, what do you need to do? He says, I need to move some stuff. Would you give me a hand? He says, yeah, sure. So they would go to this one place and I, and I don't believe he ever said exactly where it was, but I think it was around a place that they call Sardine Springs now. And they call it Sardine Springs because Doc and Ova used to camp there all the time. And Doc and Ova used to love to eat freaking sardines. And there were empty little sardine cans all over the place out there. So you know that was their spot. And Tony said that they would go and pick up about 10 bars from one spot. And he would drive out in the middle of nowhere. And it was something that Doc knew where he was going. And they would stop and bury 10 bars in one place. They wouldn't mark it or mark it on a map ring, just Doc knew where they were going. And then they would go back, pick up 10 more bars, and go someplace completely different and bury them. And they got 110 bars reburied over the course of that night. And sometime around 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, 
Tony started getting a little nervous because Doc, he said Doc was looking at him kind of funny because, you know, this is the guy that knows where all of Doc Noss's gold bars are, at least 110 of them right now. So he started to get nervous because he realized this. And so, and he knew that Doc had a pistol in the glove box of his pickup. So the next time they were burying bars, he picked up a stick and he told Doc, if you move towards me, I'm going to brain you with this freaking stick. And that's how he, that's how he left Doc that night. They, they rode, Doc let him off. He, he thought he was about to get shot and he might've been, Doc might've killed him that night. But the next day, Doc went to Charlie Ryan's house and he went to confront him and they got into an argument. Doc turned around, walked out of the house. He was heading towards his truck and most of the people knew that he kept a gun in his truck, except he was walking around the front of the truck when he got shot in the head because there's the famous picture of doc laying down slumped over the fender of his truck it's the front fender of his truck he was walking from the passenger side to the driver's side he was just <laughs> going to get in his truck and drive away he wasn't going to the passenger door to get his pistol but they said he's going for the gun somebody shoot him shoot him and that's boom he's dead and it turns out that charlie ryan the judge was a relative of his <laughs> in the trial and charlie walked and they said, yeah, Doc was going for this gun. All the witnesses said it. So Doc basically got screwed. He, he died. And so, good. So to con continue that story with uh, what happened, what did Albanos do and, and, and what happened to her with the, these gold bars? Well, that's the one thing. The rest of the bars, I don't know. You know, there's... In, inside Victoria Peak. Oh, inside Victoria Peak. Well, the operations officer for White Sands Missile Range was an Army captain named Orby Swanner. His name was William Orby Swanner. And he was a captain. He had been in, I think, the, he was in the Army in Korea or World War II. And then he came out and he joined the Army Air Force. And he became a captain and he was the operations officer. And he was the one... Originally, when the government started White Sands Missile Range, when they took over that land from the state of New Mexico, um, he, I don't want to say this, he was the guy the Army sent to check Victorio Peak. You know, because the Nosses were fighting him in court because Victorio Peak is in White Sands Missile Range, it's in the impact area, well, what they call the impact area. Um, and so they didn't want anybody there. So they sent Swanner to check this place out, see if there was anything, any truth to it. And they were digging on it. And some of the Noss's friends would go in and sneak in and see what was going on. And they watched them digging on it. So they went back, reported it to the Noss family. Ova and her family, they went to the police. They went to a federal judge because White Sands Missile Range, a government installation only leases the top, I forget, six inches or so, whatever it is of the land. They don't have the mineral rights to it. I think they had over at the time they, they didn't. A, they had a treasure trove permit on there. No, well, I, I don't think they had a treasure trove permit. I think they were just digging. Um, okay. They were trying to do things legally. They uh, like Doc took two of the bars to the mint. I believe it was in San Francisco, and there's a receipt for that. It's in an attorney's office, and uh, I don't remember the name of the town. It's, I got the guy's name and his phone number, but he's a, an income tax attorney in New Mexico. He's got the original receipt that the Mint gave Noss uh, for the 90 pounds of gold bars, two bars. Um, I mean, he tried to do things, but you got to remember, he was an Indian who he did not trust white people at all. He had a drinking problem. This was rural New Mexico during the Depression. So... He had a lot going against him because he had a lot of city folks that tried to take advantage of him. And he was a pretty sharp guy because Ova even said that he, he made copper bars with a little bit of gold in them that looked like gold bars. And if he had any suspicions that he was going to meet somebody to sell him a gold bar and they were a fed or a narc or something, that he'd take the fake bar. And there's where, that's where the stories of Doc Noss trying to pawn off fake gold bars came from. Because if he had any suspicion that he couldn't trust who he was going to sell a bar to, he'd bring a fake one. And it's, it isn't real. Get out of here. And he stayed out of jail. Because as of 1933, it was illegal for anybody in the United States to own more than five ounces of gold. 
unless you were a coin collector or a dentist or something like that that you had to work with it. So that was the big problem with claiming any gold before about 1974 or five that you found in a cave because you couldn't legally own more than five ounces. And um, so because the federal government didn't have the mineral rights to the land of, under White Sands, the federal judge told them they had to stop digging at Victoria Peak. They couldn't, they couldn't dig anymore. So this goes on and on. And then there were two guys named Figi and Burlett. One was a captain and one was an airman. They found a, a different cave in Victorio Peak from a different direction from the base of it. From there's a road that goes around behind Victorio Peak, and this and it's actual little tunnel. It starts. It goes under the road and into Victorio Peak. And he said it was so dusty that you couldn't move without you couldn't breathe. But once they got into the bigger room, he said there were three triangular piles of gold bars. And they wanted to do everything right, so they reported it to the Air Force, and the Air Force thought they were full of shit. And they said, well, if you did, why didn't you take any? They said, well, we didn't want to get in trouble. We wanted to claim it. So they made them take polygraph tests. And I've got copies of those polygraph results where they asked them, and they passed them with flying colors. <laughs> and, you know, and so it was over Thanksgiving weekend... God, I want to say, I, I don't remember what year, 73, 74, 75, right around there somewhere. If you ever see the picture of Orby Swanner's where he um, stood at, oh, hold on, I, I'll get there. Um, what had happened was when Orby Swanner was down there digging before the, federal, before the federal judge made him stop, when he got down into the lower cavern where all the bars were, back in those days, they used to use what's called carbon arc lanterns. And there are two carbon rods that spin, and there's an arc that goes between them. It lights super, super bright. That's what ships use for searchlights and carbon arc lights. Well, they make a lot of soot. And so what Captain Swanner did was he sooted his name, his army serial number, the date, um, everything on the wall in one of the lower caverns. <clears throat> and so when he told the story about being there, the Air Force said, oh, he's lying. Because he, he has to be lying, because there's no such thing as gold bars at Victoria Peak. There's no lower caverns. And he says, and he didn't say anything until after the Air Force called him a liar. And he came out and he says, okay, if I'm a liar, then if y'all ever get down into the lower cavern, you'll see my name, my service number, and the date, and everything sooted into the wall. And sure enough, 1992, Operation Gold Finder, they got into the lower cavern. There it is. Orby Swanner, that date, his service number, you know, exactly where he said it was. And Captain Swanner signed a notarized affidavit stating that Thanksgiving weekend, I keep wanting to say 73, that he personally witnessed the United States government flatbed approximately 93 million troy ounces of gold from Victoria Peak. And shortly after that, he was sent overseas for a couple of years and his family didn't see him. And then within a couple of months of getting sent back home, Something happened to Captain Swanner. He swelled up. He turned beet red. His wife thought he'd been poisoned. And then he died. Now, very interesting thing. Captain Swanner's son, Mark Swanner, not too long after that, got a job with the CIA. Well, I don't know if he still works with the CIA, but he was one of the Abu Ghraib interrogators. Oh, <laughs> Tell you a little something about the Swanner family. Um, and when I was, I wanted to talk to him about his dad. And I found the article about Abu Ghraib, right? And I was like, oh. So I called the woman that wrote the article because I wanted to ask her what he was like. Because I'm, you know, you're nervous about wanting to talk to somebody that's got a long history in the CIA, right? And, as an interrogator, especially. Yeah. So I called her and I'm like, so did you work with him at all? I mean, how was he to work with for the story? And she just laughed. She says, you know how much I worked with him for the story? I'm like, how much? He says, I called him up. He answered the phone. He was very polite. I told him who I was and the story I was writing. He says, F you and hung up on me and I never heard from him again. <laughs> so that's all, that's all she has the story. I never talked to him because I always thought it was very likely that Mark Swanner was the one that poisoned his dad. Really? And he got paid, and that was his pay, his payoff from the CIA was a lifetime job. They do things like that. That's mm -hmm. like, um, uh, God, what was his first name? 
Well, you know Woody Harrelson, right? Mm, the actor. Huh? White Men Can't Jump. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Cheers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. You know who his father was? Uh -uh. His father assassinated a, a federal court judge. He worked for the mafia. And forensic analysis has showed that he's about 90% likely to be one of the three tramps that were arrested in Dallas when JFK got shot. And they talked to him about all this stuff, and they showed him the picture, and he said, wow, yeah, yeah that does look a lot like me, doesn't it? <laughs> and that was the thing. Woody Harrelson has zero talent. Zero talent. His dad was, I don't know what part he played, but it had something to do with JFK. Because he was there when it happened, was hiding in a freaking railway car when he got arrested. And they let him go. There's no record of their arrest. And then the same guy mysteriously murders a federal court judge, and he goes to jail for life, and so he can't get paid for whatever he did for the JFK thing. So how do you repay him? You give his son a job in Hollywood. So, so I wasn't going to go there, but let's, <laughs> let's go there just for a minute. Because sure. a lot of people think, and, that, and, and there was a lot of research, and you happen to know the person who did the research, who had a book, who it's, it's, it's no longer available, but you happen to have access, and you're doing a website on it now, so that could yeah. be available, and you could have a bunch of information about this on your new website. So it, it was said, and through friends and connections that you have, that... Uh, um, uh, Kennedy was assassinated over this Victoria Peak treasure, right? Kennedy was assassinated for a whole lot of reasons. But this is one of them? Maybe. I mean, there was a lot more pressing ones that were a lot more reason to take a risk of murdering a sitting president of the United States of America. Um, okay, so we won't go into that, but we yeah, will. Yeah, because that's huge into, into itself. Tell me about this website you're going to be building and 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 what possibly they people can see and how they well what i did was um i've known john clarence the guy that wrote the gold house trilogy set Which of is books fascinating book is is unbelievable it is research. the most well-researched set of books on the victorio peak story ever made before that it was a story in lighthouse magazine by a guy named tom whittle who also helped to write the gold house trilogy books but he had one of the best stories on Victoria Peak ever. And John Clarence lived with the Noss family for about six years while he was writing these books. He had access to anything and everything. That's why he's got all the pictures. Um, and originally what he told me is he was planning on coming out with a fourth book of the set with all the documentation, all the FOIA documents, all the stuff that he gathered over six years of research. And it just, he never got around to doing the fourth book, but he still had all the documentation. So I told him if he wanted to send me the stuff that I'd build a website for it and I'll just make them free to, for anybody to access anytime they want. And it's not up yet, but it will be soon. I own it, but it's called nosdocs.com. N-O-S-S-D-O-C-S.com. Great, you can get that up for us. Absolutely. <laughs> And with that said, Mike, man, I appreciate you finally giving me an interview. <laughs> That's a wrap. Well, you know I'm video averse, so. <laughs> <laughs>